um, if everybody could introduce yourself in the chat and um, let's see, I have a couple of slides to share. Okay. Um, great. Yes. And also, um, while you're introducing yourself in the chat, um, please consider, uh, if you already have some questions for our speakers today, um, that would be great for them. Okay, wonderful. Well, welcome, Donna. Wonderful to see you here with us. Um, here we are. And um, we're really excited about this great tool. And um, here, are, here are our presenters today. Very, very exciting. And just a reminder for people who are on the call, um, COIL in its basic, most basic form is something that you do within your course and um, you collaborate with somebody else who uh, is running a similar course or completely different. You design it in advance and then the students work together and they are learning from doing, all right? SUNY COIL, we are excited to say we just, um, I'm just working on a, a new partner in Amman. And um, just earlier this morning, I was working with a new partner in Vietnam. So we are just expanding exponentially and it's very exciting, um, all the people that you could partner with in the world. And today, I am so excited to introduce our presenters because what we're doing in the field and um, what these two are figuring out is helping us better codify how to do what we're doing, how to take the work of COIL and move it from a boutique kind of way of doing it that's very personalized to your own course to thinking of it more expansively. And whenever you bring in people in the instructional design realm, which I am part of, and I thank very much um, people who are helping us figure out how to create our curriculum so um, big hats off to John. I, I just really appreciate the opportunity that we get to visualize what we're going to do. And I also just am thrilled. Gabriella has been so gracious um, in sharing case studies with us and also all of her expertise. And um, whether you're here today or you're watching this as a recording, um, this is a great way of making your COIL collaboration come to life. And um, I think oftentimes people uh, get nervous that they uh, are not gonna be able to figure out how to do this. And um, so I'm just thrilled to see everybody on the call today. If everybody can unmute and say hello in your mother tongue, it's always really nice to hear everybody. So one, two, three. Bonjour. Ciao. Hello. Buona sera. Hello. Bon, Buenas bon, tardes. Buenas tardes. Bon dia. Good. Wonderful. Oh, and please, if you can, put your um, university after your name. It's always really nice to, like Celine did and Mona did and Frida. It's always nice to see where people are coming from. Um, oh, and we have um, Glasgow Caledonia University in the house. Hi, Claire. And um, so we have a whole bunch. Great. Wonderful. So with that, um, and I hope that all of you, I, I like to 
do our presentations in a more um, relaxed kind of way. So if you have questions as we go, please throw them in the chat. And I have a feeling that I just saw a nod from Gabriella. So um, I think that Dr. Gabriella is going to be okay with the idea of answering questions as we go. And um, so that's helpful to know. And um, with that, I'm going to share my screen. And actually, um, I'm going to give the screen over to Gabriella to share her screen. And um, welcome everyone today. Thank you so much, Hope. Thank you everybody to have having us um, today and give us this opportunity to share this new tool that we are uh, um, piloting um, with John. Um, okay, so the way I would like to, to do today, as Hope was anticipating, please, you can ask questions anytime. I'm more than happy to answer uh, as we go along, and I'm sure John um, agrees with me on that. Um, I will start the presentation with introducing what type of work I, uh, I've done in COIO that led me towards the um, COIO mapping tool. But before I explain how to use the COIO mapping tool, I'll, I will uh, uh, ask John to explain the bigger picture where this tool is coming from, the work that he has has done on the general curriculum mapping for digital education um, for, di for, for online courses creation, because I think that that will, will generate that context that will make everything much easier to be uh, grasped. So I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully technology will allow me to do this smoothly. Um, here we go. So. Um, we are going to talk, we are going to present um, what we call cur Coil Curriculum Design Tool. And this is a work that we have just recently started with John. As we all know, uh, just to a bit of background, um, in terms of COIL, um, we, we kind of refer to COIL as a virtual exchange. So an opportunity to, to allow um, the, the building of the cross-curricular competencies and the intercultural competencies, even in a world when, if you remember, not far that long ago, when COVID or, um, hit and it was impossible really to travel around. But we still managed to create opportunities for uh, uh, internationalization for our students through COIL, which became also a way, not just a learning tool, but really a pedagogical approach we could use to deliver our courses. At the University of Glasgow, we recognize, in fact, the COIL as a very powerful tool for inter intercultural compet competencies development. And we have included it in our key performance indicators when it comes to internationalization. So we have the ambition to allow 50, at least 50% of our all cohort of students in Glasgow has to have an international experience. Um, a few years ago, this would mean preferably studying abroad, but not everybody has the financial means or for any other possible reasons, not everybody can really travel. So the university has recognized this, and now we can introduce COIL in our courses, and by tracking it, we can um, allow to... Um, we can allow our students to undertake those com intercultural competencies that can then be recognized in their final transcript. And this is really important for their professional development. As uh, uh, Hope has already shared, we, when we started our COIL experience, we looked at COIL, SUNY COIL, and we looked at the model that has been developed. However, with my colleagues, we decided to go a little bit farther, um, one step farther. And we decided to look into also some scholarship opportunities for research in COIL. And we um, kind of uh, broke, and broke down a little bit more 
the um, process of uh, interactions between tutors and between students. And we looked into four key themes when we look into COYO. We know that the um, collaboration between tutors has to be based on a topic of common interest, which makes possible even for dif different disciplines to undertake COYO opportunities between each other. There must be mutual enrichment. So the, the two, at least, the, because COIL can be done at least in between two institutions, the two institutions really have to collaborate and contribute 50-50 to the COIL um, sessions and the COIL courses and, uh, and recognize that there is a mutual enrichment between the two um, cultures. Cooperative teaching, we realized there was a very good way to deliver our COIL session and to allow active participation, we embedded the project um, outcome for our project-based learning for COIL and within our own assessments. So um, in the University of Glasgow, this meant um, mainly formative assessment for our courses. For other institutions we collaborated with, it could also mean summative assessment. It all depended on the institutions. But we realized very quickly that our classes were gaining much, much more than just a sharing of knowledge. As you can see on the left side, this is a traditional course where you might have a lot of different students coming from different backgrounds and cultures. They are all in the same room and they're learning together, but are they really contributing to each other learning? Well, when a COIL come into play, then we would say yes, because in COIL, the collaborative aspect will allow that step forward to the traditional course and to allow the students in the group to really share their knowledge and how they acquired the knowledge and within a bigger picture, which we um, applied mainly the the the. Pillars, I would say that the key points that are available on the SUNY COIL website. And in fact, um, whether your COIL is five weeks or when we say weeks, we really intend maybe sessions that, um, for your courses. So whether your COIL is five weeks or, or 14 weeks, whether it is part of an already existing course or it is a full COIL course, what you really need to have um, in, in your sessions is the opportunity to build icebreakers, to do team building, to develop trust. Developing trust is really important, especially when it comes to collaborative learning, because students need to feel that their, their peer support is valuable. Um, they, there must be opportunity for comparative discussions, organizing the teams, the collaborative work for the project, but most of all, you need to give your students the opportunity for presentation of their work, uh, reflection upon what they have learned and how they have learned it, and then come to some conclusions. I, I invite you to keep in mind these four key elements because they will come very useful when I will we will explain the COIL mapping tool. This is one of the case studies I shared with you. And I just made a, a slide to give you a bit of an idea of how this uh, developed for me um, as a personal experience. The COIL opportunity I had during COVID was with Iser Puni Institute, um, which is an um, institute in India where teachers can undertake their professional development. We had the opportunity, first of all, to co-design our collaborative online international learning courses. The co-design aspect is really important. We spent 12 um, meetings to try to understand each other's uh, um, educational system, each other curriculum, each other's institution needs, how do we teach. Uh, in India, for example, there is a much teacher-led type of teaching, while in, in Scotland is more student-led. So we really had that, um, that um, great conversation on how do we find that common ground. Um, we then had the opportunity to co-teach um, the courses, so there was a co-execution of our courses, and we put that into a, a bigger picture of what we called, um, we actually realized it's called the ped uh, participatory pedagogy. So we allowed our students also to come up with ideas on how they wanted to learn, what we were preparing for them, how they wanted to um, reflect upon their learning, how they wanted to present their outcomes when we gave them their project. 
And that allowed us to go into our research and action research. We produced two uh, book chapters with our students and uh, um, two, two um, peer-reviewed journal. And finally, as you can see on, you, on the right of this slide, we want us, I, I really would like also to stress out that COIL itself is not just something that you do and, uh, uh, you know, for, for the ben, just for the benefit of your courses. Because when you do COIL with another institution, um, what you do is really you develop that relationship with them. So that COIL could then lead to transnational education. And in fact, with India, we are, we are now talking about the credit transferabilities, producing micro-credentials together. Uh, we have planned to do a MOOC together. So that uh, opened up really the doors for much, much more than just COIL sessions. What we used during our uh, COIL is what is also known as project-based learning. And I wanted to put down some key elements for the framework that we would use um, when it comes to COIL. There must be um, you know, the, the, the essential designing element. For example, um, it's very important to, to uh, base your COIL, your, your COIL sessions on problem solving. Why? Because your students, when they um, look into a problem and they want to solve the problem to produce a final outcome for a project, they will come with a solution um, to the problem on their own, but the solution that they can come up with when they work in group is much, much better and much, much farther than an individual solution. And if they reflect upon it, they can really start to develop that um, intercultural competencies. Um, we also spoke to the American Association of Colleges and Universities because we wanted to have some reference point for understanding and tracking um, the, the uh, intercultural competencies that we wanted our students to develop. And we found really, really useful to use the global learning rubric as well as the intercultural learning rubric. These are two rubrics, the two, two values rubrics who are available uh, on the um, uh, American Association of Colleges and Universities website. And they gave us permission to use these two rubrics for our COIL as, um, you know, um, type of approaches. Now, um, I would like to um, give a, quite a lot of space to what is going to be the mapping tool. What you see here is the general mapping tool that John has done great to work upon, and I will uh, give the chance, John, to explain this initial tool. However, what I have done with that is to take the key elements of this tool and then changing it into the COIL mapping tool. As you can see at the top, I have put down the key four elements that SUNY COIL had on their website when it comes to uh, tasks and opportunities for students. Then I put also at the bottom the rubrics to give you the opportunity to track how the rubrics are developed during each session of COIL. And then I will give you the opportunity later when John finished to present the, the initial map to see how the map works uh, live because it's an interactive map. But I'm just sh stop sharing for now. And I think there might be some questions that we want to look at. I don't think so. Okay. Uh, uh, but it's great so far, but maybe someone has a question um, in the group. Um, or not. All right. Well, thank you. This is very comprehensive. It's really nice to see the progression. Thank you. So I think, John, then, if you are happy to take over. Sure. Thank you, Gabriella. Uh, good Good evening here. Good morning. Good afternoon, uh, wherever you are. Um, I'm just going to spend maybe um, 10 minutes or so. I'm going to show you the mapping tool we created at Glasgow, why we created it, and then how it's transitioned to support COIL activity. And then I'll pass back to Gabriella to show you the, the ways in which she's using it. Um, what I will say is this mapping tool is completely Creative Commons. We can send you the files. I can pass everything on to Hope afterwards. Mm -hmm. So if you want this, don't worry about screenshotting or anything. We'll give you, we can give you the whole thing to take and, and, and use. 
So hopefully this will pick up my screen. Um, everyone seen that? I hope perfect. So just to set the scene, <laughs> this was a tool I designed on Miro probably around about seven or eight years ago when we started to develop MOOCs. There was a there was a barrier between the knowledge of the instructional designers. We have like learning technologists, learning innovation officers and staff when it came to the notion of how to design and deliver online education and especially online education for MOOCs because it was very, very focused and it was quite different for people. So I created this design map that allowed non-subject specialists the ability to interact with the staff and build a course map based upon the course ILOs, the outcomes, the aims, etc. A lot of this work is underpinned by the theoretical framework um, by Diana Laurelard, which some people may have heard of, or from UCL. And Diana Laurelard had actually identified these six learning types that you see on your screen. That was then taken by colleagues at UCL and they created the ABC Learning Design Framework. And that was a paper-based exercise traditionally designed to help you map out a course. And it was more around blended activity at that point. So obviously we, we didn't need blended at that point. We needed to fill it online and the paper-based activity was good. But once you had mapped it out, you effectively took a picture and you were left with a static design that you couldn't change. And we needed something that could move and shift and you could work on over a number of weeks. So hence why I create, I went down like a whiteboard sort of route. Just to give you an idea of what we see here, just underneath these learning types, we're given examples. Hey, of, John, can I interrupt uh, for yes, a sec? Can you please. make the, um, the learning types, can you zoom in on that by any chance? I can. Okay, great. Awesome. Okay. That's Perfect. wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. So with these learning types, um, they are broken into the six, which is discussion, production, investigation, acquisition, collaborative building, and practice. And we have example cards just to give a hint of what we mean by each of these learning types. And it just gives a flavor for staff about what, what you can use. And then we've actually got the template that you can drag and drop onto the onto the map. And I will I'll show you what I mean by that in a moment. From that, we identified these core areas that are used predominantly within all courses, which are readings, videos, discussion, reflection points, formative and summative tasks, other activities that maybe don't blend naturally into these areas. And then we've got an area at the bottom that's more course specific. So there could be a whole range of things that fit in there that you want to capture in your course design. We've also got these stars for formative and summative tasks. And that's a great way to just make sure that you um, capture where those assignments have taken place. So how this maps works is quite simple. You effectively go through a huge dialogue with a uh, a learning innovation officer, an advisor, an uh, instructional designer. And once you start to build out your course, you just drag and drop these cards into place. And what you will end up with is a series of learning. Uh, don't, don't do that. What we'll end up with is a series of um, steps and learning sequencing that you can then provide a little bit of context to um, and how much time you expect the students to spend on that task. And as we go further on, for example, we could bring in this games-based simulation task and that will be a formative task. So I can come down here, take my formative star and just sort of pin that next to it. And I will go through the process because this is this is this um, discursive iterative design method. But what you end up with is something that would look like possibly this. So every course is going to look completely different. No course is right, no course is wrong. Some courses have a lot of video-based 
delivery, that's perfect, depending on the course aims, ILOs, and everything that we all know. So this is just an example of how we can use a, a course mapping tool. And can you this zoom is the, in? Can you zoom I, in on this so we can really see what I you got going can. on? Thank so, you. So th th these are this is a little like a course in progress. Um, so you're you're sort of seeing something that's going to come on to Coursera in the next few months. Um, but this is just where we will sit with academics and have these discussions. So you can see that the detail here is, is surface level. It's not huge. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me looking at this, but it makes a lot of sense to the academic team who are involved in building out this model. One of the key things that came out of this, I'll let Gabriella show you and talk, talk through how this has been adapted to suit Gabriella's needs for COIL. But there's one other thing that we've that we have um have been using over the past year, and this is next for Gabriella to adopt and adapt for COIL. So hopefully you're seeing a slightly different screen. I will zoom in a little bit just to make it slightly easier. So what we have here is effectively taking that design map that is um, a high level overview of each week of your course and what each step that the learners are supposed to do in your course. We've taken that and we've designed this spreadsheet to show exactly how much time learners are spending on each learning type. So, for example, I'm on week two of this course and I've got eight different steps. Okay, the steps are not important, they're just place fillers for the purpose of this task. But what we can do here is add in all of the activities that the learners are going to do based on our design map, all of the time that that's going to take the learners. It's also a bit of a task tracker, so we can see whether if I've completed my tasks, Gabriella maybe hasn't completed hers, etc. And what this actually does in real time is then build both the statistics chart at the top and how much time your learners are spending on your content each week. So where this is important for COIL is to make sure that both institutions have a shared understanding about how much time learners are spending on steps and whether or not the steps are actually the most appropriate steps for what you want to achieve as part of that COIL um, work. To just give you an example of how this, can, this works, so for example, if I were to pick a practice step, and you can see practice just now is at 10% of the chart, and in this st statistics, it's only got 15 minutes, which is great because we've only got one. But if I were to say, actually, I want learners to spend an hour on a task, you see how everything starts to change. And what this will allow us to do is to look at each week of the course. I will zoom on this just a little bit. I can, you know, Okay, well, week three is vastly different from week two. I can I can see that quite easily. Um, is that right? Is it wrong? It, you know, there, there's no right and wrong in sort of learning design to, to a certain extent, but it allows for Gabriella and the other member of staff at the other university to have a shared space to workload all of these learner tasks. The important part, I think, from this is that we've collated all this into the dashboard. So what you get here, and you could share this with students, absolutely. What we get here is each of the weeks, there's 12 weeks, how much learner time is going to be spent on acquisition, collaboration, discussion each week. And you can see the, you see week two and week three that I just sort of demoed. You see how those build up into a bar chart. It tells you which each of these are in the legend and equally what I didn't see I didn't show sorry is that we built graduate attributes now Gabriella may want to adjust this to have the coil attributes in the in the in the in the, the, the other matrices that she's shown but then we can see here that in um, week two one of the graduate attributes for that week is a competent learner and the other one is an investigative learner and those are specific to the University of Glasgow. So these gadget, ga, gad, 
graduate attributes are specific to Glasgow, but there, there may be coil generic um, language and phraseology that we want to um, that we want to show here. So I've shown you two very quick things. Apologies, there's probably quite a lot of info that I've just thrown at you. But the first part is the design map, and that's that high level, interactive, discursive, learner centric design. And the second part is taking that, putting it into this course design spreadsheet, looking at the time allocations that learners are spending on each of the learning types, understanding if that's right or wrong. And then we've got this dashboard that can be shared and presented to colleagues, to other members of staff, probably even students if we wanted to share this dashboard. Why not? It's, a, it's an indicative overview of where they're spending their time. It can only be a good thing. And this is the next phase that Gabrielle and I are going to start to focus on. Um, but I'm going to pause, I'll pass over to Gabrielle. And I don't know if there's any comments. Um, and Gabrielle will show you the coil map. Um, is that okay? Thank you, John. Um, I think we can ask if there's any questions so far. I just was wondering, um, these courses that you're making, are they fully online or are they um, for face-to-face -face or are they both or? So the, the, traditionally when we only used the map, they were fully online. We have, we've got another version of that map that has the ability to drag and drop elements to show whether the material is for on-campus or for off-campus. Um, that was an early iteration almost of Gabriella's ask for, for COIL. And then we've helped Gabriella develop the COIL map, which is taking things a step further. As a result, we're going to update our main map to reflect the look and feel of what we've designed for Gabriella. So it's given us a little bit more work. But just to answer your point on the spreadsheet, Hope, and I'll share the screen just for a second, is if I jump back into week two, You'll see that we've got an activity location box now, and from there we can decide whether activities are on campus or remote. And it just gives staff and students that sense of knowing that you know this is going to be an on-campus activity, this is going to be a, a remote activity for the students. So this spreadsheet started to, 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 um, to move forward a little bit. And again, in the statistics, this breaks up and shows you the breakdown of where students are going to be or where students should be when when completing this work. That was really helpful. Thank you. Uh, but I assume that you can use, obviously, Gabriella is going to show us how you can use this for COIL. Um, so I also wonder, it looks like you have a team of instructional designers. Is that true? Are you, so you have the professor as content person, and then you have a team that helps put together the course. Is that part of that listing from the first screen? Yeah, we we, we, we don't put together the course as oh. such. So what we do at the University of Glasgow and the trajectory we've taken is that we support staff and, and their skill set in order to design and deliver the distance education or the blended education. So I've got a team who work in different strands and they would support Gabriella with developing yeah. the design of their, of her MOOC, the one that she created in Launch on Coursera. Um, they're with her to develop her skills on the platform. We have people to do video work, but Gabriella and the team then generate all the content are, are responsible for adding all that content to the platform. And we work in a sort of consultative um, um, sort of area with them. So we don't, we don't, we don't stop Gabrielle developing those skills, so to speak. We we sort of enable those skills. That's a, probably the right way to put it. Hmm. So there is a question in the chat. Um, if your partners also use the spreadsheet map, or if it's just the tool for University of Glasgow. So no, we we um if we have any, it's always difficult to impose something. We don't we would never ask that or, or suggest that that's what we do. But if ever there's been a scenario where we're working, especially on MOOCs or maybe a micro credential, 
and we've developed that out, we invite the um, other contributors to it and they would then work within what we've got. Um, obviously other areas have their own design processes, so we don't we don't sort of force this on anyone. Um, but we can, because it's a um, a virtual whiteboard, we can add collaborators, and because uh -huh. it's a spreadsheet, we can add collaborators. So it's very it's very open. But maybe that actually, Gabriella, when you're working with your coil partner, are you sharing that? Yeah. Version? So basically, okay. I'll show you how the mirror map works for okay. it, and that okay. yeah, great. that, that gives everybody great. the chance to to add to it. But um, I I would say that as you can see, most of the work has been really done through John work on um you know the how that map that map that John just showed as was created for online education for MOOCs micro credential and the, the idea of making one for Koyo it just stemmed from me taking one of John courses and learning about the map. And that when I saw the map I was like that is what I need and I'll explain why so I'm just going to share with you my screen and I'm gonna tell you a story about me and the um, Indian institution I collaborated with now what you see just now is a, a Google uh, document that I shared with the Indian partners at the time I was planning to do coil with them now keep in mind that um there was no understanding really of what COIL was, or we had to go through a lot of meetings to try to, to share a common understanding of COIL and how we wanted to do it. So we shared this document and what we did with it is we started to fill up the, the document with a list of things that we wanted to do. So you can see that we had a pre-session reading, we had our Zoom link, and then we put down, okay, the PowerPoint that we're going to present. And immediately after the PowerPoint, we put down the tasks and so on. So we started to create a sort of list. I have to say that took us ages. And we were all confused when we were adding things, we're taking things away. It was really difficult to try to visualize what we were doing. So I'm going to show you the same exact document with this word, the um, you know what, what is on the word document, but this time by using the mirror map. So as you can see, this is a very very similar to John's, but it, it only changes because um, it, it's including the four key elements that I really wanted to track in each of my sessions. When I say session, in a University of Glasgow means two hours of uh, contact with the students, whether it's face-to-face -face on campus or whether it's face-to-face uh, -face online. In my, in my courses in teacher education, this is what it means, one session. Um, I worked with some partners in the US and for them, one session could be one hour. That is something that would have to be discussed between the, um, the two institutions when you go at the co-designing stage. However, what happens here is that every element is interactive. So basically you can copy and paste and drag it on the map. So what we did- Can was... you zoom in a little? Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no, it's the same as um, John's. Yeah. So um, as you can see, there are the learning types. Okay, so let's say for example, that my first task is an acquisition task and I can copy and paste and move it in this way, just because I, I completed the one and I would like to show like this. So can you zoom in a little more? I will, even? I will. Thanks. I will. Great, great. So as you can see here, I had in the Word document, the first thing I put down was a pre-reading for my student. So reading as in within the learning type of acquisition. So I copied and pasted the acquisition post-it and I put on the map my reading, which in my course reading was about the nature of STEM because I was planning a course on STEM. So my students had to come to the session with a clear understanding of what is the nature of STEM for preservative teachers. For me, that meant that I was 
equipping my students with a previous knowledge before coming to class that was making all of them at the same level. So I was also starting to build that trust that I needed later on for collaborative learning because they all could trust each other that they had acquired the same knowledge, but they might have different opinion on that same knowledge. So that for me was to be marked as ITD, which stands for Icebreaker Team Building and Developing Trust. So I knew that on the map, in my first session, I had a task that could allow my students to start that, that element of my coil. Then, as I showed in the Google document, I had a PowerPoint presentation. So I'm uh, the PowerPoint presentation was the first thing, piece of learning for my students when they come to classroom. I'm expecting that PowerPoint to last for 20 minutes. So I will put it down here. And that could have been a recorded PowerPoint if that is a, an asynchronous approach to COIL or could be a live, um, you know, pow explained PowerPoint. For this particular project, I can show you the PowerPoint is here. And we had an English version as well as a Marathi version because we had the opportunity for, with, with a budget for this. And so we had the opportunity for tutors in, in India to just translate the PowerPoints for us. And that gave the chance to our students from both institutions, first of all, to experience even just seeing a different language, um, how it's written. And then to, to have that feeling of belonging to that particular session because it's expressed in both languages is, is, is a, as part of what they're learning in their own uh, way. Um, so after the first 20 minutes of acquisition, another piece of acquisition, we put together a, a team building task. This team building task is an escape room, which is based on OneNote. So basically this is the tutor version. So you won't see the challenges locked, but basically students receive this OneNote file they have challenges on each of the pages, and each page is locked up with a keyword, a password. So the first challenge was based on the University of Glasgow uh, campus. So students had, both students from both institutions had to work together to try to solve a riddle that was only possible for people that know the campus at the University of Glasgow. But the second challenge was based on the Ashoka College, which is instead our partner on the India institution. And so similarly, the, um, the, the students had to collaborate to unlock the third page by solving, solving the riddle that this time was based on the Indian institution. So they spent a good 30 minutes. They had also the um, incentive because the first people, the first group that finished could leave the, break, the breakout room. We put them into breakout rooms. Um, and so we, we gave them a maximum of 30 minutes to finish the task. Um, ta the task continued with several other challenges that were based this time on the content of the course. It was uh, uh, sustainable houses, uh, designing for sustainability, all the things that we wanted our teachers to learn about STEM education and, and how to promote STEM education. So once that was finished, we asked our students to go back into the breakout rooms and start to discuss the pieces of learning that they had acquired, the precession, the PowerPoint, and the content of the escape room. So they went, as you can see here, I put down a discussion learning type. I put it down as a discussion and reflection. My students who were in breakout rooms spent 15 minutes to discuss first and they had to look into the uh, challenges for shelter in Scotland and India as part of the course itself, It's the content of the course. That was, for me, a comparative discussion. So I know at this point, at this point that I could copy and paste this element to, to label my session as a, collaborative, as a comparative discussion session. After that, I asked them to complete a Mentimeter because I had the I wanted them to express their opinion. So each group had to give a sort of summary of what they discussed and learned. So they gave, I gave them the link to the Mentimeter that is possible to apply to the map. 
and everybody, every group had a, um, a writer that had to put their contribution to the uh, to the forum. Then we discussed each contribution in class. We find we finished the lesson with a final piece of learning, which was an acquisition again, and this was about uh, biodiversity in the urban areas. And then we gave them a task to be completed in within a week. So we gave them a one week time to collaborate with each other and within their own groups. The groups were made quite um, homo uh, heterogeneous. So we had two, two students from Scotland, two students from India for a group of four. And they had to go out in their own environment and use three different apps by bird net, plant net, insect net. And they had to do a biodiversity survey. So at that point, they had the opportunity to contribute to a mirror map on all the possible different biodiversity of plants and birds that they had around, because the course itself was based on the building your sustainable house uh, using the engineering design process, which is what we, we teach in STEM education. So that is how um, I used the, uh, the map, or let's say better, I would have used the map if I had that map available when I started my coil with the Indian Institute. In reality, we did all on the, the Google document, but if I had to repeat this again, what I do is I simply make the map um, like a blank. I click the share button. I share with my partners. And then we start to populate the map in the way we think appropriate based on our courses that we want to coil. We can identify gaps. We can identify how many of the different key elements for coil we have, we don't have. What do we have to do to, um, to get to a balance? But I have to be honest, this is really just a brainstorming stage. So the map itself is not the end of it. It's just a way to really have that conversation visually. But then I would like to develop with John the Excel file associated to this map, because that is when courses are finalized and defined. This is more for, you know, this is, this is these are the tasks we would like to put in. These are the tasks we would like to take away. These are the things that we can translate into languages this, and so on. We also put down the global learning def um, rubric and inter intercultural rubric. So for this particular uh, uh, part of the, the course, I would say that um, the students would develop cultural self-awareness and they would develop the opportunity to study different frameworks for uh, um, uh, cultural differences. In this case, sustainability differences. In fact, most of the students came up with ideas of sustainability in India that are all based on solar panels and ideas of sustainability in uh, Scotland are all based on wind turbines. No wonder. Um, so, and... Finally, at the very bottom here, you can see that in any case, we look back also at what are the intended learning outcomes of the COIL courses that you are intended to COIL. So let, let's just say, stress out this a wee bit more, because COIL is not necessarily always something new that you create from scratch. It could be that you are COILing two already existing courses. So you already have the intended learning outcomes for those courses that you still have to be able to prove that whatever learning you're planning is matching those learning outcomes. And so you, you kind of track them even during the COIL sessions to make sure that you're covering absolutely everything. And this is really important, especially for us, for example, University of Glasgow, we have the um, uh, document when we create a course and we have to keep very clear which one are the intended learning outcomes, which one are the assessment, which assessment is covering a specific learning outcomes and so on. And that is something that we want to keep going with, even with a COIL. So we will insert that COIL aspect in it. And we do have a, a central team for COIL that is working really hard around the policies. So we will have soon a public policy for this, uh, for the COIL courses. So that's all I wanted to share. I'm just going to stop sharing and open up to discussion. Wow, we, okay. Everybody unmute and give Gabriella and John a round of applause. Woo, yay. Thank you. That was so fascinating. Um, 
while people are thinking about their question, I just want to remind everybody before they run away that um, next month uh, we will be having a panel talking about COIL research, especially about for USers, IRBs, and what you need to consider when you're compiling student data with your international partner. Um, so think about that. And does anybody have a question for Gabriella and for John? Um, this was really great. And I'm just wondering, besides you, Gabriella, have you had success with other people using your model? Has anybody else been using it? So as I said, the model is really just coming up. Mm -hmm. And one one member of staff in the school is now using it just now oh. to set up his, his coil with the Sh Shinshu University. And I have shared this, John and I actually have shared this with the um, European Patent uh, Consortium called CVs. Mm -hmm. So they are going to use this in within their uh, um, internal in their consortium. And we shared it with the Fulbrights as well. Mm -hmm. And they're going to use it for their Fulbright Award as soon as John and I finish the Excel file. Friedrich, I saw you unmuted. Do you want to ask a question? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Gabriella and uh, John. Um, I'm a bit, I'm honest, I'm a bit overwhelmed and I'm still a bit confused, but maybe you can help me. Uh, the Miro board as well as the sheet or not as well, the Miro board is just for the designing phase between the te collaborating teachers to get an overview. So, uh, and each, uh, the last, uh, the last board or the last uh, uh, piece of board is, you have such a piece for each uh, session. So yes. and you 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 plan okay okay so get an overview uh, for um, planning your activities during one session. So this. Yeah. You... So in okay. fact, I can share again just to show you how it looks like. So you would have session one. Yeah 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 then, yeah. Uh, okay session okay two, I, three, Yeah get it so get it get it get it get it. And because I was uh, I was a bit confused about. Uh, so if I would plan my coil project or so, I would go from from start to the uh, from the icebreaker phase to the to the comparative phase and uh, to the project work. Uh, but this is I I had to uh, <laughs> adjust myself a bit uh, from the perspective um, on 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 designing yeah so this is the, the yeah this is this is quite uh, this is quite uh, uh, valuable i think uh, to for those <laughs> who need uh, who who plans a lot of activities for those who have uh, uh, in germany we have 90 hours as one session not a complete 120 minutes but if you have 20, 120 minutes i i guess and if you plan synchronous sessions uh, as well as uh, uh, asynchronous uh, project work, uh, you can make it easier to overview to overview each session. Yeah, I, I think uh, that you can mm. really give the map the meaning you want to, because as I said, uh, one session can be two hours for me, but yeah. ninety minutes for you. And so my session will have 120 minutes as a calculation of the full, but yours yeah. will have 90. And and if we have to do a coil, me and you, then we will have to come together to a compromise on how that will look like for our students. So let's say that your students might have, we, we might map it in a way that in 90 minutes, the core of the session is done, but I might have another extra few minutes for my students to maybe yeah, do okay, a better okay. more of a reading or a better more of a, because I have that allowance, allowance of time, that, if that makes sense. Yeah, and, and another question regarding this uh, really comprehensive and uh, interactive Excel sheet uh, John presented. Um, this is 
also for planning between the teachers or uh, I saw one column different names or is it also for purpose that students can change the estimated time you had the, some some activities reading uh, 15 minutes and uh, students can type in the re the real time that they uh, needed for this activity or it is also for planning between the teachers so i really like your question because it give it gives me lots of um new ways of thinking about this that i never saw it so right now it's been designed for the academic staff and yeah. the and the learning technologists etc to, to build that out however if you share that with students and ask mm. them to then add in how much time it took them at the end of the course the course evaluation you'll be able to see on the dashboard x hours versus your x hours and that would be a really interesting comparative exercise to understand is your time accurate because obviously you may think something takes 20 minutes on general, but actually if, if three or four students are really struggling with that, that could take them two hours. And just to yes. just to see that back would be really interesting. So your questions opened up mm. four weeks of more work for me to go away and try and figure out how we build a student <laughs> uh, one. I love that idea. Love it. I love it. We're getting into the instructional design weeds here, which is good. And <laughs> um, it's really necessary as we move forward in the in the COIL virtual exchange world and wanting to make this be um, useful for everyone. So this is really helpful. And um, we just have a couple minutes left. I think we have time for um, another question. Yeah. Go ahead, Arit. Hi, um, I'm not coming across well. I am not an instructional designer or faculty. I'm a master's student writing my thesis on COIL and I'm looking to interview practitioners. So I just wanted to drop a quick message and a quick hello in right. case anyone has time in the next few weeks to be interviewed by me on mapping their experience as a COIL practitioner. I'd love to chat with you and I just dropped my information and how you can reach me in the chat. And thank you so much for a very interesting webinar. What school are you with? I'm at the University of Edinburgh, so not so far from Glasgow. Oh, look at that. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I'll also hook you up with the SUNY COIL um, global uh, so network. Much. And maybe Dan will hook you up with the University of Minnesota network. And Friedrich could connect you with the University of Potsdam network. And uh, yeah, you got people on this call that could hook yeah. you up. Thank you so much. And I've uh, dropped sure. all reach out to me. Yeah. Okay. All right. The, the link for your um, uh, your sign up slots doesn't appear to be working, just FYI, but I'll reach out over email to find a spot. Thank you so much for pointing that out. I'll correct that and I look forward to hearing from you. All right. Anybody else would like a final question? Yeah, Frida, go for it. Thank you. And thank you so much, John and Gabriela, for sharing this. It's, I, I think it is an excellent tune and potential um, beginning, for, especially for designing it. I, I remember, I think I, I went to there, Frederick, right in February in Spain. You were there, right? In the Conference of Virtual Exchange. From any collaboration, and I remember there was some one presentation also from actually from Florida University of one presenter she, she mentioned the, the the difficulty of giving this freedom for for students to oh. to engage in or kind of collaborate in the design of the of the of the activities. I mean. Just more freedom and, and not that being not that strict with timings, uh, in order to be, enable them the the a more flexible planning. However, she mentioned at the beginning they felt quite lost, and I think something like this is necessary at the beginning probably. So the 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 staff to enable them, uh, like a structured plan, 
probably first sessions, first weeks, and then based on this, they can let them the, the road, right, the, the path, so they can start getting a, a clear idea of how they can mix their money. It would be something like that, I don't know, like construct your own plate of activities, and they already know how what things like they can add and how they can construct them and give them more, provide them more freedom with, with certain um, structure initially, right? So it is great and as, as Frederick was mentioning, I think it is an excellent tool in order to go further and, and enable more um, flexibility and creativity towards students, right? And, and the, I think, um, Frida, just as I can share further that the, the experience with the map, the, the, the digital tool is great, especially when you cannot see the people, the partners. That's but okay. I tried also the paper, the paper copy and I can guarantee it becomes so much fun having to take off the the post-its and then put another post-it. And then you go like, no, I don't want that that there. Let's move it about. And at the end of a big chaos and a bit of maybe a coffee, a tea or a beer, um, you get to see the real picture there. And and, and it's amazing how you, you, you go like, I didn't see it coming in this way but it's actually really, really good. And then you can get feedback from students on after the sessions, maybe two or three sessions together. You get the, the uh, student's voice with feedback and they might tell you, you know, that task, I w at my case, for example, the one note task was at the end of a session three and students were like, why? If you had to put mm -hmm. that at the beginning of session one, we would have had much, much more fun with it. We would have done much better. And that is what happened. We moved it straight to the mm -hmm. session one and because it was so much of a flexible possibility of moving those post-its it was like like this yeah exactly and make them participate make 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 them and we involve, involve them right in mm -hmm. this in this planning it is amazing thank you so much great well thank you so much i think um frida just pointed out and you too as a visual learner and as a kinesthetic learner, this is really wonderful. So, yay. Okay, so we're gonna close up if everybody can unmute and give another round of applause and also say goodbye in your mother tongue. So, au revoir, arrivederci. Ciao, ciao. Thank you, thank you. Bye.